<laughs> We're on the same wavelength. <laughs> we ran into each other this morning. I was like, yes. <laughs> it's like we are in the flow. So, um, so we want to open it up to all of you beautiful people. If any of you have any questions for any of the panelists, don't be shy. Here's your chance to talk to these incredibly wise. <laughs> they are wise. Yes. sometimes like like when you first started talking I felt like I wanted to cry or when I got like a um, Reiki sound bath I wanted to cry and I did not understand why until you guys are now explaining that whatever connects with you connects maybe with your ancestors is that kind of right yeah I I definitely think so I mean you know I mentioned earlier like I was sh having an office space and I it was the strangest thing normally you know, I go back and forth a lot of times. I really, I care a lot. Like, I care too much sometimes what other people think. Um, but I like to be like, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> but there was something about when the building manager said to me, they're uncomfortable with a witch being in the building, that I felt like I had a thousand voices in me that got so upset that I just burst into tears. And I knew it wasn't just me in there. I was like, oh my God, I'm feeling my relatives, you know? So when Julian says, trust your body, you know, I mean, it's talking to you and it's telling you. And, and, and just like everybody else has said, go deeper, ask like, who are you? What are you trying to tell me? Do you just need to come out, you know? Because I think we are, as a society, are so conditioned to just shut all of that off. Just pull it together, go about your business and act like it didn't happen. Um, but instead, we need to be brave and we need to look, look things at it and go, what are you? Why am I feeling this way? Why are we so in a hurry to feel happy? You know, I mean, yes, feeling happy is beautiful. It's great. But why are we in such a rush to dismiss our pain and these things? You know, there are reasons why our body responds to certain people, places and things, you know, uh, intergenerational trauma and PTSD and all of these things. Yes. Um, Certain situations, if we're, you know, overstimulated, if we're, we have to look at all of these things, especially when we don't have the, you know, documented version of our life, like if we don't have access to it, you know. Um, I had partial access to it with my grandmother, but nobody was sharing, you know. So you have to trust what your body is talking to you with and breathing through that. Anyone else? Oh, hi. I'm going to give you a mic. So I'm right here. Um, thanks, ladies. You're also eloquent and um, interesting and beautiful. Um, I would love to hear you guys talk actually about the word witch. Like, for me, I'm a semi professional witch, and I have so much, even saying it right now, I'm all freaked out. I'm in a room of witches. <laughs> Um, it's so much shame. Like, I'm gay, and I have no problem saying I'm gay. I don't care. But if somebody asks me about that word, and I, all of what you all just said about it, but I feel like, how do you guys feel about a way of reclaiming it in that same way of, like, I feel like it's not my word. It's, like, all the shitty things about it. Like, it's an old hag, you know, it's consorting with the devil, like, all that shit that's in the Webster Dictionary about it. Like, how do we take that back? Like, how do we change that word? And what are your guys' thoughts on that? And I, I guess, like, I want it to be something different, and maybe we're on that pathway to it, but I feel like the word witch, like, still even though it's changed in the last, like, 15, 10, 15 years, is still really hard to say out loud in public, like, in working. So that's my question. I, I hate words sometimes are so challenging. Um, I, I'm in a constant battle with the word witch. 
I used to love saying, I'm a witch, I'm a witch. It inspired fear and also made people leave me alone, <laughs> which I loved. And then all of a sudden, people are like, oh, my God, you're a witch. Let me talk to him. I'm like, I'm not a witch. I'm not a witch. I'm an artist. I am just a weirdo. I'm not a witch. I'm an alien. I'm not. So, listen, my relationship with the word changes. It changes all the time. Um, find words that work for you. Words are so can be beautiful, but they can be very limiting. And, you know, that's why, too, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, I'm a high priestess or I'm a multidimensional, you know, being. I'm kind of half human. I don't know. Like wizard. Yeah. <laughs> Wizard's a good one. Um, sorcerer. <laughs> you know, like it's um, you get to put your stamp on it. You know, you get to put your stamp on it and make it whatever you want. You can make up your own word. It could be pig Latin for all, you know. I mean, like you can make up your own thing and, you know, repackage it to make you feel good. You know, there's there's no fast and hard rules about it, except, you know, asking, like, is this, is this something that I feel proud of? If you don't feel comfortable with it, I wouldn't suggest using it, you know, because not for empowerment anyway. Yeah. Naha, do you, do you refer to yourself as a wizard? I totally am a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you know, I... I reject labels, and at the same time, I try to describe myself. So, um, you know, I don't call myself a witch, but then I say, like, I like doing witchy things, and I like witchy stuff. Um, definitely wizard seems, like, a little bit more appropriate. I consider myself a magical practitioner, and I think about across time, like, how much more revered that was, like, my focus on the past is not so much when that was something that was shamed as something like even going back to like um, the origins of modern astrology and astronomy when um, in Mesopotamia, the astrologers, they were the priests or going back to ancient Greece when the oracles were like very, very revered or the shaman, the I medicine love oracle. woman. oracle, such a good word. <laughs> whatever that, um, the healers of, of, whatever tradition we're, we're very like exalted people, not people to be shamed or ridiculed or burned at the stake. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, I think like at the base of that, it's like the practicing of magic, the understanding that there's more than meets the eye of the physical realm. And, um, yeah, which definitely does have its, it's, it's uh, baggage. Yeah, it yeah. does. Julian, do you resonate with the word witch? I resonate with the word rich. <laughs> We're named Rich. I'm manifesting yes, right rich. now. Yes, Rich. Oh. <laughs> well, I um, want everyone in this room to maybe be that's so my rich. Word, rich. Um, I do resonate with it, but I don't use it. And I, the only reason I don't use it is because I know people who are witches that have done a lot of work to, like, do that. Yeah. So I want to honor that and, like, and just be like, okay, cool. But we could connect. <laughs> Chani, do you resonate with the word witch? Um, I guess I don't really think about it that much. But I don't, I'm thinking it was a good question because I was like, I don't think anybody called themselves that before. Do you know what I mean? Before it was like a thing. I think it's a word the patriarchy came up with to condemn. Yeah. So people that did stuff, we just did stuff. We just like, <laughs> I was good with herbs or you were good with spells yeah. and you were a great midwife and you know, like we just did stuff and it was normal and it was just a part of everyday life. And the thing I think that we're all talking about is like we lived in a world, I think the world over it seems like there's proof that every culture on the planet lived in a world where they believed that nature was animated with the same spirit and energy that we are. And so we were in conversation with nature and we were in communion with nature and we worked with nature, and we listened to nature, and we bowed to it, and we worked, we manipulated it sometimes, and we, we did all this stuff, but we were one with it in many different cultural uh, iterations, but all the same kind of feeling. So astrologers thought, you know, the planets had something, or practitioners thought, well, the entrails of animals meant something, or, you know, the herbs had a certain energy to them. And so I don't know if we called ourselves a thing, we just did the thing that we did within the community we were in and kept it moving, I think. Right? 
Okay, there's, I'm gonna, I saw a hand in the back go up first, so I'm gonna go here. <laughs> but I like the power and the fear that it instills. Thank you. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's Hi. silly to be afraid of it. Um, I wanna ask about your distrust in community and how, uh, I feel like when you're in moments of desperation and you're just like, you're trying to listen to your body, but it's telling you so many things because there's like so much distrust in the world because of history. Um, where, I know that this is probably a personal or like an individual thing for everybody, but where is the tipping point? Like where, how did you guys let go and just surrender? <laughs> it's a, I know, it's a little bit of a, you know, one day at a time kind of situation there. Um, you know, it's definitely gotten a lot better in the last few years, but mostly because I've started to trust myself. You know, there was a lot of not trusting my own self and there, therefore not trusting the people around me. Um, you know, I didn't grow up in a very nice, like in a nice way. <laughs> Um, I, you know, like I have a very strict Italian Catholic grandmother who would take care of me when my rock and roll party monster mom, atheist, but feared God, <laughs> um, you know, surrounding herself with like band musicians, drug dealers, whatever. Anyway, you, you start to not trust yourself and you all, and you're betrayed by the people around you, not just like lineage wise, but like the immediate family, you you have to make a decision to like rewrite how you're going to interact with the world. And something that's come up for me a lot, even in the last year is learning to rewrite how I perceive things um, and learning how to make decisions as though I love myself because I wasn't making decisions, even in magic, everything that I wanted, everything that I was trying to manifest or create was all out of fear. So, the moment that I decided, you know what, why don't you try looking at that as though you loved yourself? That, that's when trust and starting to allow different things to come in has happened. But also, you know, um, I, I'm sober. Um, I've got a few years sober. For me, that is a big part of me learning how to rewire my brain and my thinking. And, um, and that's helped me, too, because I had to learn how to trust other people to hold space for me. You know, this whole life has been about being self-sufficient to the point of it was killing me to be solitary. Um, and whereas we all get to that point at a point, right? We have these gifts. We have these tools. We have these defense mechanisms that work until they just don't work anymore. So... It's still a practice. I still have to ask myself, go within and go, okay, are you being like quick to react? Is this person just trying to be cool? Is this person just being human and not having these elevated expectations of who I think people should be, you know? Um, and then staying away from the people who are not good for me and not having it be like, oh, I have to burn the bridge down. It's a challenge. It's taken me 42 years to try to find some maturity. You know, I'm still working on it. Um, so I don't know if that helps with your process, but, you know, I would say just tr literally take it one day at a time. I saw another hand right now. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a question about uh, anecdotal experiences I've had in the nine to five world. I've seen that a lot of suffering, stress, abuse, et cetera, happens there. How might we be able to facilitate conversations on these practices within the workplace to uh, create more healing there? Julian, as a business owner, do you want to? Uh, yeah, but we're not stressed out there. No, just <laughs> <laughs> no I, did, I did. I worked uh, nine to five, and it was really stressful. And... Um, it's interesting, like, it's little things, like, I mean, for me, I would start bringing, I mean, bring crystals to work, 
that already just automatically starts to come like, why do you have that? Like, what, what's going on there? And then so you kind of slowly bring it into the workplace to have conversations about why this is happening and just, ask, and it goes back to everything we were saying, like start asking the right questions because the answers will start coming, you know, and you'll be ready for that. So you, by bringing the practice into your space already is setting the example and already changing, let's say the energy of that, that, that facility, that place that you work with. But also I, I'm, I'm a big person about communication and just talk. And just talk to the talk to the people, the hires hires up, because they can't do it without you. I feel like not how we were just talking about honor the people who work with you, right? Yeah, and that's something that's really important. And if it, they don't do that, I will kid you not. I think that business will collapse, you know, because everybody's unhappy. I hope that was helpful. I mean, her, then you, then, okay. I think we have a little time, so we're going to get it um, So this is a question that's sort of related to some of what we've already been talking about here, but it's more of a question of, like, looking into the future where, you know, we're at this point where um, what we do is more visible and there are ways into it that are more digestible and accessible for people. But historically speaking, every time there's a resurgence, there's a backlash. And part of safety with this, I think, is safety and community and being able to trust the other people who are doing the things and not being like catty backstabbing bitches to each other. <laughs> um, like don't actually use the craft as a structure for how you should approach other people doing magic. Um, so I guess that's kind of a question of like, how do we start building or how do we make sure we are building into our practices structures of trust and collaboration for right now, but also for whenever the inevitable, um, I don't like calling them muggles, like the inevitable like lay people backlash comes because there's still, there's still laws in the books in a lot of municipalities where you can be arrested for being an astrologer, uh, for reading cards, for saying that you can do ancestor work for people, so. Thank you. I mean, my my whole purpose at this point is in creating community. That's why I opened a school. So I think that it, as much as um, as we can find that, especially in a in a city like LA, where things we ha are so much freer to do. You know, I grew up in Seattle and. Um, I was completely in the magical closet when I was there, even though I was like very, very deep in that closet. Uh, it wasn't till I moved to LA that I could actually kind of like start sharing or, or like even like tell people what I was into. Um, I think that like just as we crack the door, it's so funny, like you were saying, like bring stones to work. I have so many students that have said that um, they were at work like at their nine to five job and a rock like fell out of their bra or fell out of their pocket and they were like, oh, no, 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 no. And then somebody in like the desk next to him was like, oh, no, come over here. Look what I have. <laughs> and like finding that you know, we found this a lot, actually, when we were um, setting up the school and, like, looking for furniture and, like, finding all the things that we'd kind of, like, talk to people about, yeah, we're opening this magical school. And when you get people alone or you get them into this one-on-one -on -one kind of space, I think that people that would not necessarily feel so comfortable putting their magical inclinations out to everyone will start to open up. And it's, like, those kind of safe spaces can um, grow exponentially from just like one-on-one -on -one interactions. But we, we all have a responsibility in, in making the community and, you know, whether it's magical or otherwise, you know, connecting to each other. And I think it's really important to vet people um, that you, you feel confident in their work, meaning like I love supporting other readers and healers and in learning different practices that, you know, employing like uh, uh, those services for myself. You know, I get readings from other people. I sign up for classes that other people are teaching. Like I, you know, and, and really when you, you know, referring people to other people too and not, um, 
I know that it's really easy to, like, in this day and age, like, people get on a rampage of canceling people, you know, or, or um, tearing them down, you know, when I think, you know, because they did something wrong. And I, I think it's important to, yes, maybe educate people if that looks inappropriate, <laughs> but, but also give them the opportunity to amend um, where they're at. And this is how we build community and trust as well. It's like, you might not have known. No one has all the information all of the time, you know? And how do we get better? By sharing that information with other people, um, you know? It doesn't mean you, all of a sudden, everyone's charging the same thing and we're all doing this the same way and the same amount. It, it, there are different levels and tiers based on experience and just not everybody is gonna be the right person for everybody. But we can vet each other. We can show up for each other. That's the one thing I miss about living. You know, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. It's kind of a small town, and it's very intense for many reasons. <laughs> um, but the thing I miss about that smallness is everyone supported each other. You know, they didn't care what group you were in or who you hung out with or who, you know, they're just like, we're here for it. And I think we need more of that in these communities, especially in larger cities and, and um, you know, across the board, so. Uh, hi, ladies. Um, so I was wondering if any of you, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if any of you ever dealt with imposter syndrome, and if so, how did you, how did you go ahead and with all that. <laughs> that is an excellent question. <laughs> I mean, I, all the, every other day. <laughs> I, know, I feel like that's a constant battle with imposter syndrome, but then I have one interaction with someone that it changes everything. I don't know, I just think it's the nature of the human experience. Just, um, stick to the things that I, I like to kind of go back to my inner child stuff when I have the imposter syndrome. I can remember like when I was five, I didn't care that I was on the floor with a bunch of stuff making potions and nobody believed me. I believed me. You know, you have to come back to that innocence again. I think that um, I use it, to, I, when, I can, when I can use it, I use it to get back to work and to get better at what I'm doing, to study harder to inquire more, to like get more rigorous about the training that's ever lasting. Um, I wonder what about it is, is useful. I think that it's, it's a tricky, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like, I come from schools, I come from teachers that are like, you work under me for a long ass time before you get initiated. And that's just how it goes. And there's good and bad to that, but I think it's important to have a kind of, for me, I'm, very, I'm, like a, I'm about lineage and I'm about getting initiated by a teacher and working with them for a long period of time. So there is a way that it can be useful as a function, like, so that, you know, I, but one of my employees, we joke, cause she'll go and read stuff about her chart online and have a total utter meltdown and text me like at seven o'clock at night, like, oh my god, does this mean I'm gonna die? And I'm like, literally, you're being such a millennial right now because you just went on the internet and read something and you have no idea. You have like a tool, but you don't know what it's doing, and so you're just cutting yourself with it. And so we need, we need, we need to to understand what mastery takes and what time it takes and what care it takes and what discipline it takes. And then there's the imposter syndrome that comes in for me out of an experience of being like severely abandoned and having nobody be able to tell me what reality was. And so I would just make it up for myself. And the reality was that if everybody else was abandoning me, that it must not be any good. And so when I have something big that I put out into the world, that voice, that inner critic, comes up in a very similar way as the other one does. It says, you know, you should study harder or do the thing or work more. And so that's the, that's the self-mastery, is really getting in between those two places and understanding when that aspect of my self-saboteur, 
which is really just a coping mechanism gone wrong, is coming at me and trying to actually kill the baby. Do you know what I mean? Like kill the creative energy and not let me live. And that's a very real place as a human being. I think we've all experienced that. We all have some, kind of, we have diff probably have different coping mechanisms with it, but we all have it. And so that's a place where I have to get in and say, it's also okay if I did a bad job. I'm also allowed to exist and be in the world if I did a shitty job. If I did it wrong, even, I'm allowed to still be here. And so it's like cleaning your life for yourself and knowing that you'll do better and you'll work and you'll do all the things that you need to do. And that sometimes it's going to be all, all of those different variables. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think what you said is so important about, like, first of all, everybody has imposter syndrome. <laughs> and also, um, my favorite quote about perfectionism is that it's the lowest standard that you can hold for yourself because it's the only one that's impossible to achieve. And I think we need to remember that because so many of us are beating ourselves up feeling like we have to have all the answers and be perfect all the time, but it's not possible. We don't, that's not part of this human experience, but that's a really good question because it's a big issue for a lot of people. Um, Naha, have you, do you have any wisdom to share on how you deal with imposter syndrome? Well, I want to bounce off of actually what you just said before that you guys just said, and that and something that we were talking about um, before we sat down, which is just not being afraid to mess up, and that's truly where the things. This is something that like my clients and students ask me about so much: is how do I gain confidence? How do I gain self worth? How do I gain self love? How do I get value for myself? And it's my belief that you only gain those things through rectifying mistakes through going through challenges and overcoming them through falling off the horse and getting back on again so it's you have to be like willing to do all of that and it's like especially with our magic to be willing to put that out there and and release the fear of that a little bit that's the only way we can get to the place of having some self-ownership and some the sense of self, which is going to rise you up out of the imposter. Yeah. Julian? Can I be honest? What's Please. imposter syndrome? <laughs> so, <it's>, so <laughs> imposter syndrome is that feeling that you are, you're, you're an imposter, you're fake, and everybody's going to find out um, that you are just okay. pretending that you okay. know what you're doing, but really you don't. Yeah. And it's all going to fall apart at any moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Honestly, I would I say mean, I hear, I hear. That's what it's like. <laughs> For me, it's, it's about like yes, that always comes up, but it's about showing up. And like for me, like I had the positive syndrome coming here. I was like, oh, I'm not worthy of being here. Da da da. Do you know when I showed up? Why? Because if you're supposed to be there, you be there, and I was here. Yes. And I think I'm doing a good job. All right. <laughs> that comes up for you, you know that you yourself have put the intention for that to come to you, so take it, you know, if you feel right about it. So. Yes, beautiful. Well, so I have one final question for all of you beautiful people. And we've had a, a, a discussion tonight that's a lot, it's heavy, right? Like we're dealing with some heavy issues here, but I want to end it on a little bit of a lighter note. So I just would love for each of you to briefly share something that you're feeling really inspired by or excited about right now. And just it doesn't whatever whatever comes to mind. I have I have to say just like being here and being in this space, um, just this moment and everyone around. It's like it's so exciting and it feels like it's so funny to me. I, I don't know if it was seven or eight years ago. Uh, I was across the way in the other side. And I had a little pop up, Metallica, and it's like life has just changed so much. Like I never wanted to do this work, and um, the fact that I get to do this work and be able to create and spend time with amazing people who I admire, and I'm like, oh my god, these are my friends. <laughs> um, and I can see the ripple effect. That is so exciting. And thank you for 
being an LA mom. I love you so much. It is my first time to follow our panelists. Uh, it, you know, just as people, as individuals, I respect and honor you so much. I'm just so happy to share um, this journey with you. Marcella is one of those people that like is just sincere. Like you, there's nothing about you that's not. It was beautiful. So proud of you. <laughs> Thank you.